Amen, amen. He is risen. Yes, he has. Yes, he has, he has, he has. We celebrate that today. If we haven't met, my name is JP. I have the privilege of serving on staff here at Harris Creek. Welcome home if you're a guest with us. And one thing interesting about our family is uh, we have birds. And so some of you, you know, have cats and dogs. We have birds. When we moved to Waco, we shared our home with three birds, one of those, two parakeets, and one was a, a green parrot named Emerald. And the way that I uh, came, uh, you know, how we received this parrot was she had flown into a church window and knocked herself out. And some kind pastors found her, knew that I loved birds, and gifted her to us. And so uh, here's a picture of Emerald. There she is, sweet, sweet birdie. There's another one. And, uh, and so when, it's, when it was pretty outside, what we would do is, is we'd put her cage out on the, the back patio. And she would be out there and just sing to you know, the wild birds and whatnot. And, and uh, one day I walk out there to check on her and, and the cage is empty. She's not in there. And so I go inside and I begin to look around throughout the house thinking the kids have maybe carried her in, but I can't find her anywhere. She's nowhere inside. She's not in the cage. So I begin to think like, I wonder what happened. Like maybe an animal got her, maybe a snake or something. Who knows? I'm, I'm sad. You know, we lost our pet. And, and then I remember we have a security camera on the, the back patio. And so I went and reviewed the footage. And so this is what I saw. She gone. If you listen to it in slow motion, she's saying, I'm free, I'm free. And I get it, she's a bird that, that wants to be free. She doesn't want to be in the cage. And I start with that because I imagine there's some of you that came here today to Harris Creek and the general feeling in your life is a desire for freedom. You, don't, you wanna be free, you don't wanna be caged. You don't wanna be caged in addiction. You don't wanna be caged in sin. You don't wanna be caged in some relationship that's, that's really challenging. You don't wanna be caged in anxiety. You don't wanna be caged in depression or despair. There are things happening in your life right now where you feel trapped and you feel stuck. I know that when I came to church and when I met Jesus, there was a general sense in my life that what I most desired was freedom. Like I want to be able to do what I wanna do when I want to do it. And, and for a lot of us, when we think about Christianity, it actually represents some sort of prison. Well, that's just rules. Those are things that I have to do. God wants to, to steal privileges from me. He wants to take those from me. And what I want you to know up front is that he doesn't. He, he's not trying to rip you off. Ultimately, and what we celebrate today is God's greatest effort to display that his desire for you is freedom. He wants to set you free ultimately from death. Like as you think through so what so many of us want, the freedom that we actually want is freedom from death. We want the, the freedom to, to live a healthy life. We, we want the freedom to escape the pains in this world. And I'll show you just by evidence of how much money we spend on an industry affectionately called the anti-aging industry. Okay, these are, are creams and, and supplements and, and things, processes, you know, that we do to, in an effort to, to try to live forever. In 2008, uh, this industry was valued at $162 billion. That's, that's a huge number. Five years later, it more than doubled in its value. And today, just the, the profits from that industry today uh, will be $330 billion. That is what we spend in an effort to stay young, to live forever, to not age. And we also do it with health and wellness, right? Working out with diet, exercise, making investments in those sort of things. This year, Americans will invest $34 billion or more than $34 billion in gym memberships. We'll spend another $33 billion in dieting. We're spending money in, in this effort to try to live forever. We don't wanna die. 
Because for some of us watching right now, you think, well, I don't know what happens when you die. Do the lights just go out? Do I, am I become worm food? Do I just go to the ground? And others of us, we have this hunch, this, this feeling that if I die, I'm going to face judgment and I'm going to be judged for the things that I did when I'm alive. And I don't want to do that. I would love to escape judgment and I would love to live forever in a place with no sadness no, no depression, no cancer, no sickness, no mourning, no heartbreak. And that is what God offers us through Jesus Christ. And this is why we are a people who are excited. It's not about a bunny and it's not about Easter eggs. God has given us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's not just something you grew up hearing your grandmother tell you. It's the truth. It's real, like congratulations as you're choosing from the world religions and, and the cults that the world has to offer you. You chose correctly when you placed your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ, the one who raised from the dead. And so if you're a part of Harris Creek, we've been in this series called Cross Examined, where we're looking at the characters that surround the crucifixion. And we're interviewing them, looking at their lives, and asking, what can we learn about God through them? And so this will wrap up our series this Easter Sunday. And really what we're going to ask, what does it mean that Jesus sets you free? What does it mean that we've been freed from death? And so on Easter Sunday, of course, we're going to look at Jesus Christ, but we're going to look at another character that surrounds the crucifixion. I want to show you that I believe that God has gone to great effort, he's taken great effort to place you in the story, that you have someone in the crucifixion that represents your character, that God put you in the story to show you what Jesus has done for you. But before we get to that, we're gonna have to back up over a thousand years before Jesus. So we're gonna do a little history lesson. I hope you got your coffee this morning because I'm going to start in Genesis and then I'm going to go to Exodus and then I'm going to go to Leviticus, everyone's favorite book. <laughs> and so we're going to look at how we have, uh, there's a freedom from death foretold, there's a freedom from death displayed, and there's, there's freedom from death forever. Before you leave here this morning, I want to show you from the scripture there's a freedom from death forever. And so let's just start with, with number one, freedom from death foretold. Freedom from death foretold. Who, who knows what Easter eggs are? Some of you are like, I had one for breakfast. Uh, and, and like some of you are like, well, after this, you know, we got to, you know, the, the Easter bunny's going to come. And, and so I'm not talking about those kind of Easter eggs. I'm talking about the kind that Marvel movies have mastered. Okay, you tracking with me, some of you? Taylor Swift music videos are full of them. If you're lost, I'll, I'll tell you, Easter eggs are something that we see in movies and videos that are a future reference of what's to come. It's a, it's a really subtle reference in the, in the video or in the movie or in the literature that shows you, hey, this is where we're going. And you can look back if you're a big fan of Marvel movies and you can start to piece the picture together and think, oh, that was genius from the producer that they put that there subtly in the background so that I would know later in, the, in two movies that's what happens. That's the Easter egg. The Bible is the OG Easter egg, okay? <laughs> That's sort of like, like God invented that concept. And so I want to show you some Easter eggs. And I don't care, you know, maybe you've been in church your whole life. This is your first time. You're going to learn something today, uh, this Easter Sunday. 2,021 years prior to Jesus showing up on the scene. So today, 2,021 years after Jesus shows up on the scene, Jesus is on the scene. We go 2,021 years before he shows up on the scene. And there's a man named Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham is married to Sarah. God promises them a son. Abraham and Sarah struggle with infertility. Okay, so they, they don't have a, a child together and she's approaching 100 years of age. She miraculously, as God always does, he keeps his promise. She gets pregnant with a son named Isaac. So this is the long awaited son that they finally have. And Abraham, when Isaac is a boy, hears from God to, to kill him, 
to sacrifice his one and only son. This shows up in Genesis chapter 22. And so Abraham loads Isaac up with some wood and they begin to hike up a mountain called Mount Moriah. All right, they get to the top, Abraham builds an altar and he's going to sacrifice his only son in an act of faith to God and he hears from God, stop. I I know now that you are faithful, that you will do what I asked you to do. This is history, the place is real, the time is real, it's been documented, this man really lived, his son was really there. And Abraham looks up and he sees a a ram or a goat in a thicket. A goat is caught in a bush. And this is the first example of substitutionary atonement. Now don't, not off on me. I know that's a 10 cent seminary word, but it's important. Substitutionary atonement. Atonement is something that is paid for something that was done wrong. Okay, something like a ransom of sorts, something that is paid for something that is done wrong. Substitutionary, where we get the word substitute, is when that is paid in the place of something else. So rather than Abraham's only son dying, the goat will die. This is a sacrifice. This is why Abraham says in Genesis 22, first, verse 14, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I say mountain, Mount Moriah. We later call it Calvary or Golgotha. It's the same mountain Jesus climbed with wood on his back to die for our sins. You see the Easter egg? You see what God's showing us? 500 years later, 1500 BC, the Israelites are enslaved to Egypt. Pharaoh, Pharaoh is over them. He makes them work, toilsome labor. Provide for the Egyptians, but these are God's people. And God says, hey, I'm going to free you. And so the way that he does that is he sends 10 plagues. If you've been in church long, maybe you remember from VBS, you know, Moses goes to Pharaoh, let God's people go. Pharaoh says no. Moses sends the frogs and the gnats and turns the Nile to blood. And you've seen this before, but there's a purpose to it, right? And the, the last, the 10th and final plague, God is going to kill the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. And so the Israelites, for them to to live, for their sons not to die, what they have to do is get a spotless lamb, one per family. They have to kill this lamb and, and take its blood and they dip a hyssop branch in the blood. It's a particular kind of branch. They dip it in the blood and they put it on the doorpost. Let me show you how. They put some blood over here and some blood over here and some blood up here so that it runs down and pulls at the base of the door. You see that? Blood here, blood here, and blood here. It runs down. Over a thousand years before anyone has ever seen a cross, before it's even been invented, God says, I want you to take the blood of a spotless lamb and put a cross on your door and I will spare the life of your firstborn son. And what will die in place of your son is a spotless lamb. This is substitutionary atonement. You will be spared. Jesus, when he's on the cross, it says in John that they took a hyssop branch and put a sponge on it to give him a drink of wine vinegar. Jesus, this week that he died, it's the Passover week. The meal, the last supper that he ate, the one that we celebrate communion from, that was the Passover meal. The day that he died, Good Friday, that's when they would have killed the spotless lamb. This is all happening. Do you see the Easter eggs? Do you see what's going on that God's given? Some of you have been in in church your whole life. Maybe you read the Bible every morning. We have to see these things. Firstborn son dies and God's people go free. Around the same time, they are given instruction in the Levitical law. Leviticus chapter 16 teaches us about something called the Day of Atonement. Maybe you've heard Yom Kippur. We're given really specific instruction of what to do in this. You have a high priest, his name is Aaron at the time. He's to kill a bull to make a sacrifice from a bull as a blood offering for himself to cover his own sins. Then he is to get two goats, 
two spotless goats, right? He kills one of them in this bloody display of a sin offering made to the Lord, and one of them he sets free. He cast lots, that's like rolling dice to determine which is which. I want to remind you that what they did at the time of crucifixion, they cast lots for Jesus' clothes to figure out who would get them. We see these things popping up there, important details the scripture shows us. Aaron is to cast lots, this is Leviticus 16, verse eight. Aaron is to cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by, chosen by Lot as the scapegoat, or the goat of Azazel, your scripture might say, shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. If you've ever heard the word scapegoat, it comes from this text right here. It's where, where we get the actual term from. And so one goat dies for the sins of the people, substitutionary atonement, and there's one that is set free. And these are shadows. These are shadows to show you what is to come. Do you guys know what a shadow is, right? A shadow is not the object itself. It's something that the sun makes visible to us that the object may be there or that the object is coming. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So God says, hey, I'm gonna send the ultimate sacrifice in my son, Jesus Christ, that we would have the audacity to call the Friday that he, called, that he died good because it was a payment for our sins, an atonement, a covering for our sins, a substitute in our place that he would die like that goat. But what about the one that went free? What about that one? Let's talk about freedom from death displayed, number two. Freedom from death displayed. Last week, if you were here, we talked about Pontius Pilate, and how he's a people-pleasing politician, how he didn't want to crucify Jesus, that he wanted Jesus to go free, uh, but the people continued to rally around him saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate has a plan though, because in the time of the Passover feast, it was customary for the governor, Pilate's the governor of Judea, is a, it was customary for him to release a prisoner. Certainly, they're going to want him to release this prisoner, this murderer, this one who has led an insurrection against Rome named Barabbas. Surely that's who the people will ask for, and yet they call for Christ. They call for Jesus to, to Pilate's disappointment because he didn't want to kill Jesus. Remember, his wife told him not to. His plan was to not have to kill Jesus. He wants to release this prisoner. This is what it says in Mark 15. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to, to you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. And here we have the second goat. Barabbas. Can I tell you a few interesting things about this man, Barabbas? First of all, he's being tried for the very thing that they found Jesus guilty of, the Romans found Jesus guilty of. They said that he had led a political insurrection. That's what they say about Jesus in Luke chapter 23. So Barabbas is under the same sentence against Rome. But do you know what his first name is? Anybody know what his first name is? It's right here in the text, Matthew chapter 27, verse 16. It's in your Bible. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. His name is Jesus, the second goat, the one who will go free. We have the scapegoat. But something interesting about him 
is we've been pronouncing his name all wrong. It's not Barabbas at all. I'm talking about his last name, if you will. It's actually Bar hyphen Abbas. Bar Abbas. And, and this is important because, like, if you've ever heard of the last name McDonald, that Mick means son of. Mac Farland, son of Farland. Osama bin Laden, Osama, son of Laden. In Aramaic, that prefix is bar. Okay? Bar mitzvah, bar, means son of. Okay? So a son of something, son of someone. You see this all throughout the scripture. People have this name. For example, when Jesus calls Peter, he says, Simon bar Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. And so here we have bar Abbas. Who's Abbas? Well, we see this word in the scripture a few times. Uh, in Mark 14, in Romans 8, and then here in Galatians chapter 4, it says this. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. His name is Son of the Father. His name is Jesus, Son of the Father. Now, Son of the Father is a strange name, kind of like a generic name, not Son of Jonah or Son of John or Son of Jesus, but Jesus Son of the Father. There it is right there in the middle of your Bible all this time. Jesus, Son of the Father, goes free. What, what Luke th chapter 3 verse 38 says that Adam is the Son of the Father. Adam is the one that all sin ushers the world and we sit under the sin of Adam. We are sons and daughters of the Father if you've trusted in Jesus. You are children of the Most High God. What God does is he goes out of his way to take you, your character, and he places you in the story. There you are, behind bars, caged, with a crime against Rome. Now this is a big deal, because the Romans were happy to behead you with any old crime. Had you stolen something, had you done something wrong, you know, deserving death, they would just take your head off. But if you had a crime against Rome, like you led an insurrection as an example, they wanted to make an example of you. They preserved this special kind of punishment for you called a crucifixion. This is where you would die slowly and publicly, right beside a road that people would walk by all the time so that they would think, I better not mess with Rome. And this is what Bar Abbas is guilty of as he sits behind this cell. He's facing the worst kind of judgment, the worst kind of punishment, a slow, torturous death. That's the sentence that he's under. No hope of going free until this man Jesus shows up, another Jesus, the one that was born be killed in his place. And the crowd says, give us Jesus. And Jesus dies the death that Bar Abbas deserves. And Bar Abbas goes free. And there you are at the crucifixion story. The one deserving death, the one under great punishment, the one who faces torture and you get to go free. We gotta feel that. That's why we celebrate Easter. That we've been freed. That the cage door has been opened. He has the same name. He's committed the same crime, but he has a different result. Matthew 27, verse 26 says, then he released Bar Abbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Bar Abbas goes free, and Jesus dies in his place. And I tell you that because I am Barabbas. And you are Barabbas. You are him. You're the one in the cage of anxiety, the cage of addiction, the cage of pornography, the cage of materialism, the cage of pride. You're always right. No one wants to argue with you. The cage of self-righteousness. The cage of materialism. The cage of making this world your home. The cage of despair. And they open the door. And the wrath of God is satisfied on his own son. 
so that you can walk out a free woman or a free man. This is the Easter story. And like that, the Son of God falls slave to death. But Easter. My third point is freedom from death forever. Freedom from death forever. That Jesus dies, he goes in the grave, he's there for three days, and as the prophets tell, he comes back to life. He's seen he, he, these cowards of disciples turn courageous. They give their lives sharing the gospel. Jesus defeats the grave, giving us hope for eternal life. The payment, his blood poured out on the cross. That's the check being written. And the empty tomb shows you that it's cleared, that it was good that you now too can live forever with him with the hope of eternal life. This is the first sermon ever preached by Peter at Pentecost, Acts chapter two, verse 23. This is Peter speaking. Peter the coward denied him to a 12-year-old girl, that Peter. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked man, sorry, wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, this is what it says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We are no longer under the curse of death. And this is, you guys watched that baptism video. This is why we do weird things like take people and dunk them underwater. You have been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, raised to new life and walk in him. For it's no longer you who lives, but God's Spirit who lives in you. You're a new creation. Why would you walk back into the cage? Why would you walk back into the cage? God's doing a unique work here. And because of where we get to do ministry, we get to be a part of a powerful movement of God just, in, just by the fact of, of our zip code, that people come from all over to this city. It's a strange thing. How many of you are here today that don't live in Waco? <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, so it's Easter. I get it. Family comes into town to Easter. Let's just talk about last week for a second. Somebody came up from Ohio. Somebody came up from San Diego. Somebody came from North Carolina, said, hey, I'm here looking for a job for no other reason than I want to be a part of this movement of God. And someone came up from Lubbock. Several people came up from Dallas just to talk about what God is doing here. But one of my favorite conversations was a gentleman from McGregor. He came up and he said, yeah, I'm here because I lost a bet. <laughs> okay, all right, I love the bet, I love it. Uh, tell me more. And we got to talk and I said, hey, I ask everybody these same two questions. If you're a member here, you've heard them. If you're a guest, I'd encourage you to answer them yourself. Between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure, if you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? Between one and 10, are you five, a coin toss? Are you two, you've done some things? Are you an eight, I'm pretty sure? How sure are you? You should have a number in your mind. That's what I asked him. He said, I'm a two. I said, well, the second question, if you stood before God and he said, why should I let you in, what would you say? And at that one, he took a step back. I said, man, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say. What could I say? I don't know. If you stood before God and he said, why should I let you in, what would you say? So I just don't know. Uh, and I got to tell him how he could live forever, right? How he could be free. We got to talk, I said, 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can be a 10, you can be certain, and it's not because of what you've done. That's, it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's not what we do, it's what God did for us on our behalf. 
I got to tell him what we're celebrating today, that there was a cross that represents a payment for your sins, an atonement for your sins, a covering for your sins, that Jesus died in your place as your substitute. He died the death that you deserve. And the empty tomb gives you hope for eternal life. I said, hey, if I give you tickets to the final four, it's a conversation I had right here last week. If I give you tickets to the final four, floor seats, half court, great tickets, and you fly over there to Indy and they stop you at the entrance to the stadium and they say, why should we let you in? What are you gonna say? And he looked me in the eyes and said, because I got tickets. I said, that's right. And I said, well, what if they ask you, did you pay for the tickets? He said, no, they were a gift. I said, that's the gospel. If you stood before a, a, a holy, perfect, almighty God, and he says, why should I let you in? He said, because you paid my way in through your son. You did it. My faith and my hope and my confidence is what you did for me in Jesus, that he died in my place. An, an eternal God suffered hell in a moment so that I don't have to. I have nothing to boast in. And that's the hope we have. Not, not just a... It's not just delusional preacher talk, right? The empty tomb shows us that Jesus defeated death and gives us hope for eternal life. And so we've been set free from death. That's freely available to anyone who would place their faith in Jesus Christ. And so in summary, freedom from death was foretold in the Old Testament. We have lots of Easter eggs, if you will. And freedom from death was displayed through Bar Abbas, and that same freedom from death is displayed through you and I, the way that we live, that the cage has been opened and that we've been set free. And freedom from death is forever for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. There's a story told about one Easter Sunday morning that a pastor comes up to the church and he's carrying a rusty, bent, old bird cage and he set it by the pulpit. If you can just imagine that. Several eyebrows were raised, and as if in response, the pastor began to speak, and I'll just read it to you. These were his words. I was walking through town yesterday when I saw a young boy coming toward me swinging this bird cage. On the bottom of the cage were three little wild birds shivering with cold and fright. I stopped the young man and asked, what do you got there, son? Just some old field birds, he replied. What are you gonna do with them, I asked. Take them home and have fun with them. I'm gonna play games with them and pull out their feathers and make them fight. We're gonna have a good time. But you'll get tired of those birds sooner or later. What will you do then? Oh, I got some cats. They like birds. I'll watch the cats kill and eat them. The pastor, moved with compassion, was silent for a moment. How much do you want for those birds, son? Huh, why you don't want them birds, mister? They're just plain old field birds. They don't sing. They ain't even pretty. You can get all you want right over there. They're not that hard to catch. How much? The boy sized up the pastor as if he were crazy and said, $10. To his surprise, the pastor reached in his pocket and took out two $5 bills. He placed it in the boy's hand, and in a flash, he was gone. The pastor picked up the cage and gently carried it to the end of the alley where there was a tree in a grassy spot. Setting the cage down, he opened the door and by softly tapping the bars, persuaded the birds out, setting them free. Well, that explained the empty bird cage on the pulpit, and then the pastor began to tell another story. One day, Satan and Jesus were having a conversation. Satan had just come from the Garden of Eden, and he was gloating, bragging, yes, sir, I just caught the world full of humans down there, set me a trap, used bait, I knew they couldn't resist, I got them all. What are you going to do with them, Jesus asked. Oh, I'm gonna have some fun. I'm gonna teach them how to hurt each other, how to hate and abuse each other, how to abuse their own bodies and with drink and drugs, how to shoot each other and make bombs and kill each other. This is going to be fun. And what will you do when you get done with them, Jesus asked. <laughs> I'll never get done watching them suffer. How much do you want for them? <laughs> You don't want those people, they ain't no good. Why, you take them and they'll just hate you. They'll spit on you, curse you, 
torture you and kill you. They just care about themselves. You don't want those people. How much? Satan looked at Jesus and sneered, all your tears, all your blood, your life for their lives. Jesus took the cage, paid the price, and opened the door. And I do believe with all my heart that we have an enemy who's alive and active. He's been given authority in this world to steal, he desires to steal, kill, and destroy you. But you need to know this, do not leave confused. We do not believe in dualism. Jesus it needs not to negotiate with Satan in any way, form, or fashion. After all, it was actually God's wrath who was satisfied on the cross. So God loves you. You hate your sin. Your sin desires a payment. And because God loves you, he paid it. He satisfied his own anger against your sin on his son. That's what happened. And then he showed you that he's bigger than death, giving you hope for eternal life with an empty tomb that we celebrate today. That's Easter. That's the hope we hold on to. That we're going to be in a place with no sadness, no depression, no sickness, no cancer, no heartbreak, no disease, no depression, no despair, only joy, only worship forever and ever and ever and ever. Not because of what you've done. There's nothing you've done that disqualifies you from that place. God delights to show you mercy, he says. He takes great joy in it. But don't you dare walk back into that cage. There's a tradition, several commentaries believe that Bar Abbas became a Christian. That's pure speculation, we can't know. There's, there's no way I could say that with any level of confidence from the stage. But, but the conclusions that they draw are because his name is, is, uh, is there in all four gospels, which is extremely rare. It's usually just reserved for believers, as though the gospel writers were to say, you know, Barabbas, he sits on the second row on Sunday, go ask him, you know. But again, I don't know. I don't know. Here's what I know. There's no way that man walked out of that cage and realized that someone paid a great price for his freedom only to turn around and walk back into it. No, he's got a story to tell for the rest of his life. You're not gonna believe this. No, there I was, like, you know, I killed somebody. Maybe that's you, maybe you killed somebody. I was a murderer. I led a charge against the very people who had to set me free because it's not their Jesus. This man, he has the same name as I have. And you won't believe, they, I don't even know if he did anything wrong. All I saw him was like healed some people, cared for people. He was always moved with compassion. He seemed like a pretty good guy. And they killed him instead of me. And they killed him instead of me. They killed him instead of you. And in the same way that he has a story to tell for the rest of his life, so do you. There's, it is impossible. It is impossible, humanly impossible for you to get that and not tell that story. I don't know how you would. Father, help us to get that. To live for it. To know that it's true. I pray that as we look at the cross, that we'd see an empty cage. A tomb that we deserve to be in. Pray you'd hit that with us in a fresh way this morning. Hit us with that in a fresh way this morning. Please, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.